double mask to Canada. So our speaker today is Ed Chesser, who is a specialist in ventilation for contamina contaminant control and fan system energy conservation. The 1973 Industrial Ventilation Conference at University of Washington was an important week in Ed's career. It got him started designing and specifying ventilation systems that intercept pollutants before they get to a walker. Ed Chesley began his involvement with hospital ventilation in the early 80s as the WorkSafe BC resource person for employers with chemical exposure problems. He was called on to help design systems control to control formaldehyde, ethylene oxide, and other various chemicals in various hospitals. Ed was asked to evaluate ventilation systems in operating rooms and post-anesthetic recovery rooms and advise on ways they could be improved starting about 1984. Some of his recommendations were implemented and seemed to reduce exposures. Scary? But Ed has 25 years experience to draw on when he got a call about controlling nitrous oxide in labor delivery rooms in 1999. So ladies and gentlemen, Ed Chesser. Thanks, Sheila. Yeah, so well, my story sort of starts in 1999. Uh, I'll tell you how it, how it came to be that we've got double masks here in, in BC now. So what is a double mask system? Depending on who you're talking to, it, you might say it's a continuous flow waste anesthetic gas scavenging system. That's how an anesthetist would probably describe it. If you're talking to a ventilation engineer, uh, you'd say it's a closed capture local exhaust system for exhaled anesthetics. Um, other people might just say it's an effective means of protecting medical personnel from anesthetic gases. It's, it's all of those, really. So back in 99, I was working at the compensation board and got a call from Richmond Hospital that uh, they had been doing some monitoring of nitrous oxide in their labor delivery rooms and found levels were above the TLV. Um, and yeah, the nurses were noticing that it was having an effect on them. Nitrous oxide is provided to women in labor to help with the uh, labor pains, right? And if you breathe a lot of nitrous oxide, you go to sleep. Um, having the nurses go to sleep while they're trying to help with the mom in labor is not a good thing. So, uh, and there are other issues for the nurses too. Uh, Long-term exposure to nitrous oxide tends to um, cause an increased risk of miscarriage and birth defects. And in the short term, see, they get drowsy and that uh, gives them headaches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, and I'd, I'd heard some of this long before when I was uh, looking at other at ORs and so forth. Anyway, uh, the, the hospital was looking for a solution to this overexposure problem and hoped that some better ventilation system could be found and implemented in those labor delivery rooms. So uh, I applied my industrial ventilation background and asked first, you know, what's, where does the nitrous oxide come from? How does it get into the room? And the answer was pretty clear. Most of it is um, in the expectant mother's exhaled breath. So uh, I thought, well, OK, how much exhaust airflow do you need to catch all of a person's exhaled breath? When I talked to Susan Kennedy, who some of you here know quite well, uh, a an expert in respiratory issues, and asked her what the forced expiratory volume one second would be for your uh, above average healthy young woman that's in labor. And she gave me the number, which I converted to CFM. And it came out, I think it was about four or five CFM. So uh, I said, right, well, so if we can exhaust from right close to the source, right close to the, the person's face, maybe three or four times that airflow will get the, the ex um, emission under control. And obviously, I'd, I'd learned from past experience that exhausting, the closer you get to the, your source of pollutants, the less airflow you need to exhaust whatever it is you're trying to keep out of the, the workspace. So yeah. Um, the nitrous ice oxide arrives in the room at Richmond Hospital anyway in a, a gas cylinder and it's a 50-50 mix of nitrous oxide and oxygen. Obviously I wasn't much worried about the oxygen, right? That's a little bit of extra oxygen in the room isn't going to hurt much. Uh, and it is metabolized by the patient. But nitrous oxide and other anesthetics aren't metabolized. They dissolve briefly in the body and then they're exhaled again. So yeah. 
there is a possibility of leaks from your uh, regulator hose or demand valve and adding to the nitrous oxide in the room, but that's not uh, usually an issue. So what they had for controls in Richmond Hospital at the time was this scavenging mask. And uh, you can see this is the standard anesthetic mask that the patient holds up to her face. The black collar just behind it is uh, a scavenging fitting. And there's a, a valve system in here that allows your exhaled breath to um, open a valve and flow out through the black collar and out through the pink hose. But that valve only opens if you've got positive pressure in the mask, which means you have to have the mask held tight to your face while you're exhaling, which is not usually the case. During, during the period that a, a woman is using this, she might only have her uh, a mask against her face for 5 or 10% of the time. She does need to seal it to her face and inhale to get the gas delivered, but uh, when she's exhaling, obviously, she doesn't need it there. And we observe, or our researchers observe, that it tends to be out at arm's length a good bit of the time. So anyway, and in the back of the photo here is the demand valve, and the person holding it is holding onto the fitting where the gas supply comes in. So yeah, that, uh, we did check the airflow in that little pink hose, and it was about to, in the order of 2 to 3 CFM was all the flow we got when we disconnected it from the, uh, the valve there. And as I say, when the, um, if it isn't, what you say, there'd be no flow in that little pink exhaust hose unless the mask is sealed to the person's face and they're blowing to open up the valve. So that wasn't too great. There was general ventilation in the room, uh, a supply grill near the ceiling, and an exhaust grill in the opposite corner down near floor level. Uh, and in this picture, you can see the exhaust grill up above uh, Catherine Toe's head there in the, in the wall. Sure, that's the supply grill up in the ceiling there. And the exhaust grill is in the far corner of the room, sort of on the left side of the picture. These are our three researchers that gathered a lot of the data in Richmond Hospital. Um, what else can I tell you about that? Not too much. The subsequent pictures show the rest of the detail better. I guess, yeah, off to the, also off on the left side of the picture is the bathroom where some of the nitrous oxide was used while the, the mom-to-be was taking a shower to uh, help with the, the cramps or whatever. So limitations of that existing mask are that it just has uh, intermittent flow scavenging. And say the scavenging doesn't happen unless there's positive pressure in the mask. What we decided from some work in the lab, um, yeah, there was a fair bit of work in the lab before we actually got to Richmond Hospital. We built a prototype mask. We hooked it up to a small fan. Um, we had a researcher put his, his or her head in a small chamber that we had in the lab. And we monitored the carbon dioxide in that chamber and found that if, they, if we had a flow of 15 to 20 CFM through the mask and the person was holding it close in front of their face, the CO2 level didn't go up much. If we turned off the exhaust load of the mask, the CO2 level went from 350 to 1,000 parts per million in a few breaths. And how, how many people know what the uh, normal sort of concentration of CO2 in your exhaled breath is? Anybody give any thought? It's about 3%. It's, uh, it's quite a high concentration of CO2 in your exhaled breath. So yeah, if you're breathing into a very small volume, CO2 concentration goes up in a hurry, and that'll knock you out, right, if you keep rebreathing your exhaled breath. Um, Anyway, yeah, we had determined that with 15 or 20 CFM, we could have some useful impact on the, the uh, emission from a person. So this is our, our prototype mask. Um, we just took a six inch diameter plastic bowl and cut one hole in it to let the uh, anesthetic gas into the inner mask, which is the same one we had before. And we cut another larger hole to connect an exhaust hose onto. And picked a hose that was big enough to handle 15 CFM. Uh, we also cut a hole in that inner mask and installed an exhalation valve from a, an industrial respirator so that if the person had the, the mask held tight to her face and was exhaling, the exhaled breath would come out through that exhalation valve rather than through the valve on the demand valve. And that way, again, your exhaled breath would be exhausted out through that, that hose there. So that's, that's what we were testing in the, the chamber in the lab, and that's what we took with us to Richmond Hospital to test. And yeah, this sort of shows the, uh, our sampling arrangement. Um, 
the hose in Marika's left hand there was hanging over the pillow where the mom would be, you know, close to her breathing zone or in her breathing zone uh, while she's on the bed in labor. And the other end of that would be connected to a Miran analyzer that we were using to get a minute by minute reading on concentration there. And then this other hose was going from the Miran into the bathroom to see what happened when the uh, nitrous was being used there. The fitting in the wall on Marika's right is uh, just a standard built-in vacuum cleaner fitting that we use to connect to uh, a small uh, inline centrifugal fan back in the near the exhaust duct in the hallway, and we ran the hose from that to our mask. So yeah, oh, there was one other feature I should have mentioned that we put a small filter in the fitting between the hose and the mask so that uh, any spray or solids or whatever that a person might exhale wouldn't get into the exhaust hose. There's concern about um, to say contamination of the exhaust hose with whatever might be in the person's exhaled breath. And that proved to be a bit of a challenge getting our little filter in there. We didn't have a great system method for doing that. But anyway, um, so our experimental method to see whether this was working or not in the actual labor delivery room with real people in labor. Well, we decided to measure a lot of things. We measured the size of the room, the room ventilation airflow, the time of day for all the activities around the nitrous oxide use. Um, we weighed the gas cylinder before and after, so we'd have a measure of how much gas each patient used. With the new mask, we measured the exhaust airflow through the mask before and after, and we got a personal uh, a reading on the nurse's personal exposure with a dosimeter badge, one of those uh, things you put on just at the start of the, the action and take off. Uh, we took them off just after the baby arrived and sealed them up and shipped them off to the lab for analysis. So, and we had our researchers in the room doing sort of minute by minute observations of the location and mask, relation, mask related actions of the patient. You know, was she in bed? Was she walking around? Was she in the shower? Where was the nurse in relation to the patient? Uh, concentration of nitrous oxide reported by the Miran in the room. And we were checking intermittently whether nitrous was being used in other rooms nearby because there was a certain possibility of the whole department getting polluted. And we also had a second Miran that was monitoring the uh, concentration of nitrous at the nursing station. And that produced a real uh, interesting anecdotal experience that uh, one day we had our researcher in the nursing station keeping an eye on the Miran and a nurse came in from another uh, labor delivery room where we weren't doing any research. And the Miran went from its normal sort of reading when things were happening around there was two, three, five parts per million. It went to 50 parts per million, which was its upper limit and as the nurse walked by. And they sort of looked around, what's going on here, tapped the meter. And uh, anyway, the nurse did what she had to do in the nursing station, went back into the other room, and the level dropped off back down to five parts per million or so. 15 minutes later, she comes back into the room, boing! <laughs> the nitrous level goes back up to 50 parts per million. And uh, they both say, well, this is really, really quite interesting. What we figured out, they, this nurse was working with a patient that was using nitrous in a room that was less well ventilated than the one we were doing our research in. And she carried enough nitrous with her in her clothes and her body to peg that meter as she walked by it, which was a bit scary, right? We don't know what the level was in that room, but I'm sure it had to be well over 50 parts per million. It's, um, so anyway, yeah, sort of confirmed for us that, yeah, okay, using nitrous in an unventilated space could probably get you pretty buzzed. Um, so anyway, the last part of our uh, experimental method was that uh, we requested feedback from nurses and we requested feedback from patients. So what did we learn from all this? Well, after a lot of data analysis, which to which I owe Kay Teske and Marika a lot of thanks, um, we figured out that nurses' exposures were reduced about 50%. The rate of Entinox use by the patients varied from 10 grams per minute down to about 0.15 grams per minute. And this is something we'd expected to learn, that there was a big variation. The nurses had told us that some patients would go through a whole cylinder of nitrous and halfway through a second one. Others would use very little. It, yeah. Individual variability is significant as far as the patient's concerned. A lot of the observations of the location of the mask in relation to the patient's face showed that 
the mask was more than 300 millimeters from the face. And uh, we were pretty much convinced, just from industrial ventilation theory, that if that, with that exhaust airflow, if the mask was more than 300 millimeters from the face, we wouldn't be getting much uh, capture of the, the exhaled breath. It was effective if the mask was within 150 millimeters of the face, but not much beyond that. So that was an issue for us. Uh, that would explain why the control wasn't as good as what we'd hoped for. Uh, we found there was an apparently random variation in the room ventilation rate. Not a huge variation, but significant. Um, after the mask was used in the shower, the flow rate dropped about 80%, which we attributed to moisture getting on our little filter between at the, where the mask and the hose were connected. Um, so that would be a problem with the, the filter. So feedback from the patients. Most were willing to use the new mask again. They didn't have a big problem with using the mask. Uh, some wanted a longer hose on the mask so they could walk around more with it. Um, they, some mentioned that the mask was uncomfortable to hold. They couldn't get a good grip on it with their hands. Um, it was mentioned that the connection point should have been closer to the bed. I'm not sure why that was. Didn't get, didn't uh, cross-examine our patients. <coughs> some uh, patients found the outer mask made uncomfortable contact with their faces. So that was obviously a, an issue with the design of our bowl thing there. Um, the hose fell out of the mask fitting sometimes, which, oops, obviously a mechanical problem with our system. And the uh, researchers who were putting that filter between the mask and hose found that was a bit difficult to do. So, conclusions. <coughs> we decided, um, I'm going fast here, the, um, the continuous scavenging flow of 15 CFM, which we had <coughs> there did result in significant lower exposure than the intermittent flow scavenging. <coughs> we concluded our mask design needed improvement. Uh, we decided, we figured out that we needed a way of keeping the mask closer to the patient's face. And uh, because that would also reduce exposures, right? Reduce that source to hood distance would improve capture and reduce exposures. We did some calculations on the um, that the amount of gas that people were using and uh, figured out that if you want to dilute the average room concentration to 25 parts per million, which is the TLV, during the time that uh, your patients are, are using the gas, for 50% uh, of patients, you need 800 liters per second. So yeah, basically your median patient would need that much airflow. <coughs> now that isn't necessarily going to reduce the nurse's exposure to the TLV, she's closer to the source than the room exhaust drill, right? But say to get the average down to that, you need 800 liters per second, more than double the flow they had. If you want trying to control the emissions with dilution for the 90th percentile user of nitrous oxide, you need to double that flow again to 1600 liters per second. So yeah, that's some guidance, I guess, for people that are doing ventilation design for labor delivery rooms and perhaps for other uh, situations in hospitals. And yes, we <coughs> I sort of knew from my past experience that if you could arrange a displacement ventilation style of airflow over the bed in the patient room, <coughs> excuse me, bring that fresh air right down into the nurse's breathing zone, you'd get a better ex result on controlling her exposure than uh, if you were just doing the sort of mixing ventilation, the, the airflow pattern they had in this room. There's a challenge with that, though, that uh, they, the nurses told me you can't have very much air motion over a newborn or because uh, a breeze blowing across the newborn baby will cool them off too fast and cause him obviously a problem. Uh, so yeah, and right after a child's born, they like to put it on the mom's chest for a couple of minutes just because that's a good experience for the mom and the newborn, I guess. I haven't got any first-hand knowledge of that, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, you got to protect the baby from a draft at the same in the same place and a few seconds after, you want to provide a draft for the nurse. I haven't worked out yet how that would be done. But uh, anywho, that was some ideas to toss out there, there some challenges for people. The other recommendation we made was that uh, hospitals should install a duct and fan system that would provide uh, 15 CFM, we've since revised that to 21 CFM, of uh, scavenging gas flow. So 
a direct exhaust from the mask would be a good thing to have, assuming that someday there would be a mask available to do that. Um, we suggested they install a control system to control the general ventilation airflow, so you could bump it up to 800 or 1600 uh, liters per second, whichever, and then cut it back to about 300 liters per second half an hour after people stop using the, the nitrous. That would give it lots of time to purge the nitrous out of the room. Uh, and that would be for partly for comfort reasons, partly for energy efficiency reasons. There's no need, unless you're using nitrous oxide in a labor de delivery room, to have more than 300 liters per second air exchange. Um, and yeah, find, try to find some uh, air supply patterns, diffuser locations, etc., which would work for both the nurse and the newborn. So, yes, after we got all that done, uh, we sent our report to the granting agency and uh, Chanya Pan, who's been one of our one of our alumni here, was working for OSA at the time. He did a better literature search than uh, I had done previous to this and uh, found up an article, found an article in the Swedish Journal of Anesthesiology from 1986. This is happening in 2002 or so, right? Um, which described a double mask arrangement that had been used in operating rooms and was doing a good job of controlling exhaled anesthetic gas. And gives me a copy of this. There's photos in the article that show a mask that's way more sophisticated than the one we had. Answered more, most of our issues with the, the mask design. Duh. I just spent three years trying to reinvent the wheel. And here's one that comes in six sizes and works perfectly, right? Oh, good. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is what the, the Swedish uh, folks were using back in 1985 or 86 when they did their research. Uh, you can see you've got the inner mask. Um, this one, yeah, it depends how it's set up. The exhaled, well, anyway, yeah. In, in an OR, it might be set up exactly this way, and you'd have the anesthetic machine hooked up out here on the far right of my picture, uh, and it allows for gas to come in and exhale breath to go out. And then you've got same diameter hose actually, connects onto this fitting at the bottom there and draws away the exhaled breath. And there's an opening between the two, the inner and outer masks here where you pull in your 21 CFM or less, depending on uh, what the anesthetist wants for airflow. So, yes, I started learning more about that system. <laughs> Contacted the folks in Sweden and said, why aren't you selling this in Canada? <laughs> because we, we could use it here. We just figured out that something like this might work. So, um, so they were, anyway, found out they were first used in operating rooms to protect staff from waste anesthetic gases. Um, studies showed they, in ORs, they reduce exposure by 85 to 95%. The fans, they have, uh, they'd used a different kind of fan than we use, much higher pressure sort of fan. Uh, they use about 400 watts per patient to power the fan, whereas one, I think one we use only used about 50 watts, but theirs worked better, so they can, they're allowed a few extra watts. So my goal when I started this project at Richmond Hospital was to develop a, a mask that would provide effective control of the anesthetic gas at the patient's face. Uh, once I found out that these ones existed, I said, hmm, forget about developing a new system, let's get the one from uh, Sweden introduced into Canada. And that was an interesting, <laughs> that's been an interesting experience. Uh, I started out by learning a bit about the company in Sweden that was making these things and they obviously got communications going with the owners, convinced them that uh, maybe it was a good idea to, well, they were sort of convinced. They, they had been looking for somebody to distribute this system in North America for 15, 20 years. And where they'd been looking is at uh, conferences, medical conferences, right? Anesthetist society conferences. Uh, and I guess they'd done that because that had worked for them in Holland, apparently. They found an anesthetist there who uh, tried out the system, liked it, and had become a very effective distributor. So anyway, uh, numerous trips to the States and Canada, they hadn't found anybody yet, and then I come knocking on their door. So uh, I did convince them that uh, we could bring it into Canada. Uh, we had to find out what the regulatory requirements were, so I talked to some of my contacts in the healthcare industry, <coughs> and we found out that uh, to bring this into Canada, we'd have to get Health Canada licensing, um, and we'll have it sort of, you know, anointed by Health Canada, 
and the fans and any electrical, the other electrical parts would have to be CSA certified. So we contact Health Canada and uh, I call, like, well, I think I phoned to start with, whatever, got in touch with the folks at Health Canada and said, we want to bring this system into Canada, what's the requirements? So the first uh, word I got was that the whole thing is a class two medical device. And I said, that's nice, what's a class two medical device mean? Well, it means you have to have a class two medical device license for the manufacturer before we can consider letting it into Canada. Okay, so there's an application form on the website and you start reading the requirements in there. One of the first things is the manufacturer has to be ISO certified. So I get in touch with the folks in Sweden. Are you ISO certified? Uh, no, we've never had to go there. We've sold this system in 25 countries. They've all, all these other countries have said it's a class one medical device for which the requirements are much less stringent. So, nope. So, well, we'd like to get this into Canada. We're gonna have, you're gonna have to do the ISO thing. Well, that's a major exercise. <laughs> it took them two years of writing uh, uh, procedures and policies and being examined by ISO examiners and all the rest. But they survived it, just barely. <laughs> Another interesting sidelight, when they were about half or two-thirds of the way through that process, the Swedish government came knocking on the door and said, we've been looking at your double mask again, and we think it's a class two device. So you, you're going to have to be ISO certified and all that. And they said, well, okay, we're in the midst of that, no big deal. But it, it turned out, I, I, I don't know exactly what they went through with the Swedish government, but they were kind of shell-shocked by the time they got through all that with ISO and the Swedish government. Um, Anyway, they got their ISO certification. This was, well, we started in 2008, and I think it was early 2010 they got their, uh, their ISO certificate. Then they needed a few months to recover before we started the Health Canada process. Uh, and it turned out to be a cakewalk, really. Once the, uh, I, I called, again, talked to Health Canada folks and filled out this application, listed all the parts in the catalog as part of the Class II medical device application and uh, sent in that with the fee. And then I waited a while, I got a call back to say, we're looking at your application. We don't think the fan and the flow meter and those things are really medical devices. Okay, bit of advice. Don't argue with the regulatory authority, right? You do what they tell you to do. And if they change their minds, you don't argue. You don't say, oh, okay. <laughs> you say, yes, let's do that. So anyway, I revised the application about three times, ended up with half a dozen items instead of 140 on the, uh, the list. And uh, they waited a while, and voila, the license arrived in the mail. So uh, that was, I say, very low effort as far as I was concerned. Patience required, but other than that, not much. Um, so then uh, I wanted to import these things so I could sell them here. Well, it turns out to do that, you've got to have a medical device establishment license for the people that are doing the importing and selling. And uh, that, once your manufacturer has his class two license, is Again, dead easy. You fill out an al another application. And you got to write up little policies for how you're going to record serial numbers. Yeah, part of this this whole medical device class two thing is that all medical devices have to have part numbers, serial numbers, lot numbers, all this sort of stuff on them. Every little piece has to be numbered, and you got to record the numbers of all those things and who buys which serial numbered mask or part. Um, so yeah, anyway, you. For your medical device establishment license, you have to write up all your procedures for that. You have to have a procedure for handling a recall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we did that anyway. Put together some fairly, fairly well. Yeah, all my procedures fit on three pages, actually. Um, I think it was a total of five or six different procedures I had to have. But anyway, the license arrives in the mail. No big deal. Except six months later, I got a call from an inspector with the Health Canada Medical Devices Branch saying. Uh, your procedures don't really cut it. It's, uh, there's, here's a list of requirements for each procedure. So it turns out you got about three or four pages per procedure instead of six on, three, two, on two pages. But okay, guidance was provided. The guy was friendly. Actually came to visit and had a, a look at the, the product. and our, uh, it, We discussed how we were going to record all this stuff. And it's all working out. So then, uh, yeah, the folks in Sweden, well, yeah, we, we had to get CSA certification. So I talked to some folks at CSA. 
and asked, you know, what do we got to do to get these uh, this different equipment CSA certified? And they said, well, first you send us lots of technical information about the equipment, and uh, then we give you a quotation as to what it will cost, and then you pay us the money, and then we start you send us the equipment, and we'll test it, and tell you what's wrong with it, and you fix it, and we test it some more, and we tell you what else we found wrong with it, and we you fix it, and we test it some more, and eventually you get your CSA certificate permission to put the CSA logo on your product. So, yeah, the quotations were a bit of an interesting experience. We got those. It's about 20 grand to certify something like a, a fan in a box with a bit of controls on it. And, uh, yeah, if you got two different kinds of, well, anyway, we're into it for about, at least the folks in Sweden are into that for about 45 grand so far to get the two kinds of fan systems certified. Uh, and there's some more stuff we want to get certified. We might have found a way around one of the other problems. But anyway, um, we actually took sample, a sample fan into the CSA lab and did a bit of a demo to explain to them how this whole thing's supposed to work. And uh, a few months after we got the quote, the manufacturer coughed up uh, the money, we coughed up a little of it from here too. And uh, six or eight months later, we had our CSA certification. So, yeah, oh yeah, part of that process too was we had to get a lot of information from component suppliers for CSA so that they had sort of a, a history of where each component came from and whether it was UL. Basically, we had to make sure all the little parts that went into it are, were either UL, Underwriters Laboratories, or CSA certified before they went into the box. So they weren't starting from scratch. They were just saying that what you've assembled these CSA certified parts in an okay way and that the whole thing works, meets our standards for 20 grand. Okay, there's not much competition in that business, right? <laughs> if you want to you put a CSA seal on it, you got to work with CSA, I think. So uh, anyway, yeah, we went through this process. Um, manufacturers shipped over several replacement components. Mostly I went to the CSA lab and installed them just so there wouldn't be more delay waiting for them to install them. And uh, yeah, I called every month or two to say, how's the process going? And uh, say about a year after we got the quote, a little more than a year actually, we had the CSA certification and yeah, a couple of months after that, the first CSA labeled fans were shipped, and they're now in customs in Vancouver here. So <laughs> the timing is pretty good. We've, I think we've almost sort of come to a landmark anyway in this whole process of getting the system into Canada. It's, uh, yeah, along the way we found out that this system can be used to control anesthetic gases in the post-anesthetic recovery room, in emergency wards, uh, ambulances, and it's also used, the, the fan and the piping system can ultimately be used to control surgical smoke. You can't control both the anesthetic gas and the surgical smoke with the, the same system because they have to run at quite different pressures. But uh, you can have two parallel systems, which is twice as many fans and things for us to sell, uh, and control surgical smoke. Are many of you familiar with the problem of surgical smoke in ORs? Yeah. Okay. Some of you have heard about it. Yeah. What? Um, it's produced by electrocautery, which is called diathermy in uh, Europe or England or wherever. Um, and yeah, what they do, this cut you open without having a lot of blood spilled, is uh, take, they do the, the cutting with an instrument like, uh, right, go to the next slide. Uh, oops. Uh, okay, never mind. I'm, can I go back? How do I go back on this? This way, right? Right, okay. Never mind. We'll go through, we'll follow the slides, just make it easier for the folks online. Um, so, anyway, yeah, they, to support the um, double mask, you've got generally you'll have a central fan and control valves installed in a mechanical room. Uh, there'll be a control cabinet next to the fan, and that adjusts fan speed so you have a constant pressure at the fan inlet. This means a lot more to ventilation engineers than it does to most people, but anyway. Um, you can have an, a motorized control valve so that the people in the OR can turn the anesthetic gas flow off to a low setting, about, about 15 CFM, or the high setting of 21 CFM. And to handle this flow, you install a one and a half or two inch duct from the um, operating room back to the fans in the mechanical. 
for the valves in the mechanical room. So in each patient room, you install a silencer uh, in the wall near your self-closing valve where you connect on the, the hose, like the one we had, very similar to what we had in Richmond Hospital, really. There's a flow meter is connected into the system next, uh, just and that's so nurses can check that you've got the proper exhaust flow. You can hang the, the hoses. There's little hangers available for those, and a control panel to control that motorized valve if that's what you're using. Energy implications. Um, yeah, the current CSA standard for ventilating operating rooms calls for 20 air changes per hour, which is quite a substantial airflow. And all that air has to be exhausted, right? You can't recirculate the air because it's often polluted with the anesthetic gases and surgical smoke and whatever else. Uh, so there's a considerable cost to heating and cooling that air and pumping it through the hospital. I think with the local exhaust ventilation for the gas and smoke, you can have at least uh, probably better air quality in the OR with 10 air changes, which would mean half the energy used to heat, cool, and circulate air. So, yeah, and the 400 watts per room to power the local exhaust system, uh, or each local exhaust system, is pretty small compared to what's being used in the general ventilation system. And with that, I, I would suggest they could operate the general ventilation at 10 air changes per hour, which is what they've got in a lot of older ORs. This, this 20 air changes per hour is a relatively recent thing. And previous to that, they were designed and built, ORs were designed and built for 10 air changes per hour in Canada. Apparently in Europe, the standards are all different as far as that's concerned. There could be a greenhouse gas impact of doing this local exhaust for um, sir, um, anesthetic gases. Because less heating and cooling and fan energy means less CO2 emissions, right? Um, and nitrous oxide is a pretty powerful greenhouse gas. So where you've only got nitrous oxide in your, a, a contaminant in your gas stream, you can get a catalytic converter to install on the discharge side of the fan and break down the nitrous oxide into, I guess, nitrogen and oxygen. Um, so that would be applicable in emergency wards and labor delivery. It wouldn't work in your regular ORs because there the patient gets a mixture of nitrous oxide and various uh, fluoro, 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 fluorocarbons, whatever. Stuff like uh, freons, right? <laughs> Only they call them desflurane and enflurane and other kinds of fluorine. Uh, and those things would kill the catalytic converter. So you can't put those into the, the catalytic converter. Uh, so, yeah. Denmark, uh, ambulances I mentioned, they're, most of the ambulances in Denmark apparently got this double mask installed a long time ago. There are special masks they can use for um, where they're using nitrous oxide in dental surgeries. Uh, they're just their nose mask rather than a nose and mouth mask. Makes it a lot easier for the dentist to get at the teeth. Um, so surgical smoke, yeah, is generated by the late, um, these electrocautery systems. And there's also laser surgeries that can generate surgical smoke, apparently. And that can be a major source of eye, or, uh, eye and respiratory irritation for OR staff. And there are some indications that uh, where they're using this electrocautery or laser to burn off uh, warts, that the virus in the warts can be inhaled by the, the people doing the work and cause them to have warts develop in their respiratory tract, which, yeah, I don't think that would be a good thing. <laughs> Growing warts in your sinuses? Uh, so, yeah, catching that smoke at the source is something people have been working on for a while, actually. It can be exhausted directly from the instruments. Um, and if you're doing it with a central exhaust, again, you, you have a special dedicated system for that. Uh, with this system, they have uh, used two-stage filtration in the OR to keep the solids out of the ducts and valves and things. Um, and yeah, I've, have any of you had uh, electro, any experience with breathing that kind of smoke? I did just recently. I was at my dentist's and he had to burn away my gums a little bit to get out a cavity near the gum line. And the good news was I've got my dentist and his uh, assistant trained. They use local exhaust whenever they're making air contaminants in my mouth. So I didn't breathe much of it, but the local exhaust thing was pulled out of my mouth before the smoke completely cleared. And it doesn't smell good at all. <laughs> it really sort of burns the, the sinuses right away. Uh, so yeah, I can, I can sympathize with the nurses and doctors that don't like having that cloud of smoke pollute the OR. Not good at all. So anyway, with the surgical smoke system, yeah, there's uh, an on-off valve is installed 
And it, uh, basically, when it senses current in the power supply to the um, electric rotary pin, it opens the, the valve, starts the gas flow, and a few seconds after the current flow stops in the power supply, it'll close the uh, close off the airflow to the electric rotary pin. Um, and yeah, and there's also a, another control that the uh, surgeon or whoever can dial the flow up and down and adjust the, uh, basically he's adjusting the pressure in the system that they compensates for his work style and for loading of particulate on the filters. As you dirty up the filters, you need more suction to maintain your airflow. So that's, that's part of the system. And there's a picture of an electro cautery pin with the power supply connection and the white exhaust hose back to the primary filter. And then there's a secondary filter that would be connected on next to that and on out of the building. So yeah, there's the little switch you can see here on the side of the pin is for, what does it say? It's for the position, the two positions are cut and coagulate. And I guess if you don't have your finger on it, it's off. But uh, yeah, so that's how they stop you bleed or cut you up with make, without making you bleed. And I wonder how that got inve you know, invented. What, what gave anybody the idea that they could have this electrical system to do surgery and so forth and stop bleeding? My best guess is that they were dealing with an electrical burn victim, right? Electric shock victim. I noticed that he'd lost a serious amount of flesh and he hadn't bled much. Maybe he, this is a good thing, right? Um, at least they're not bleeding, not you know, losing the flesh obviously isn't a good idea. But uh, not bleeding after when you're cut is maybe not such a bad thing at all. So anyway, there's a close-up of the, the tip of the pen. I think this little bit of plastic, this is a clear plastic extension here, that probably comes off when the surgeon is ready to start doing his cutting. And then the exhaust would be through the larger diameter clear plastic collar here, back through the handle, through the hose, and away. So yeah, you don't need much airflow to catch smoke when you're within a centimeter or so of the source. And uh, that's why you only need this, but it's about a quarter inch diameter hose on the electric cautery pen. Uh, but you need some serious static pressure even to draw a little bit through a tiny hose like that. So there are existing surgical smoke systems. Uh, and most of them have a, a fan filter unit that sits on the power supply cart right in the room. <coughs> they have some drawbacks. Uh, the fan tends to be noisy. And uh, the charcoal filter in these fan filter units doesn't catch all the gases. So there's still some odor and pollution gets back into the OR. Uh, and the filters cost a bundle. I, I met a guy that has sold those systems for a while. He says some manufacturers will actually give the hospital the, the fan filter unit just in return for getting the replacement filter business. Sort of like buying a, an inkjet printer, right? The printer's dirt cheap, you pay a fortune for the cartridges. Uh, so, yeah. And I've heard that some uh, surgeons refuse to use those systems because they don't like the noise. That's a bit of a drawback. Um, with the central fan systems, you don't hear the fan noise at all. So that's, that's neat. There's no charcoal filters. The, the gases are exhausted outside. Um, so, yeah. I think the uh, the central system has some significant advantages. So anyway, yes, I guess I've told you this, the history already. We got our uh, medical device license and medical device establishment license last year, and the CSA certi certificate came through in August, and we're in business. CSA, and this was yeah. I got a few more slides here because I was talking to consulting engineers, and they used most of the same proposal. So consulting engineers have a role to play in getting these systems up and running and working. We don't need to really go through the details on that. Um, if you're working as an industrial hygienist with these things, you want to make sure the engineers do their job properly and get the proper flows uh, in these systems so that the whole thing works. And, uh, well, yeah, one other good thing about the double mask system is that the components are all made to be reused. Everything but the filters on surgical smoke is made to be used a couple hundred times or more compared to what they have now. Those little pink hoses that we showed you earlier on, they're thrown away after uh, one use. And the masks, I, well, they do use the mask. Yeah, they, at least the ones we were looking at in uh, Richmond Hospital, they are cleaned and reused. But uh, yeah, these systems are, uh, generally speaking, very reusable. So yeah, <laughs> one other thing. we. We still haven't done is get CSA certification of the motorized valves. Um, and yeah, hopefully that'll, the folks in Sweden will decide to cough up the money to do that soon. 
So recognize the folks that, that helped with this whole project. Um, the engineers that helped me build the original prototype and so forth were Jennifer Rowe, Samira Barakat, Eric Hung Oliver, and uh, Tyron McMahon, and then Dr. Tony Hodson and Don McAdam were mechanical engineering profs that helped out with the process. Research planning and application writing, uh, Anna Matheson from Richmond Hospital and Kay Teske helped out a lot with that. Uh, in the hospital, those are my researchers that did all the work there. Hospital staff, there was a number of people that helped out. Uh, and yes, uh, data analysis and writing, Marika and Kay, Chun and Phil Bigelow all had major input there. And that's the end. And yes, so we have uh, some maps here. Anybody want to go over uh, Questions? Right. I'm just curious what uh, feedback you've had from the electric cautery pen from surgeons and doctors in terms of its use and as opposed to what they normally would use. Does it get in the way? Do they, do they mind using it? Uh, I haven't heard a lot about it I've, and I haven't actually talked to a surgeon about it. Now I'm online. I can't come here. Um, yeah, I haven't actually talked to surgeons about the electric cautery thing yet. I've just had sort of secondary feedback from nurses and and other folks that work in the ORs. And that's, and I had a call about 10 years ago, I guess, from uh, a healthcare, health and safety professionals group who wanted me to research and talk about surgical smoke control. And that was, uh, they, you know, well, obviously I got a lot of information from them too about what's out there and how it's used. And yeah, they were pointing out some of these issues that I, I mentioned today, uh, that say some doctors would use it, some wouldn't. I, I understand there's, what should they say, the, the younger doctors are more inclined to use the smoke control, the old farts are less cooperative, not all those old farts are good listeners and helpful kind of guys. Um, so yeah, it's, say, it's out there. You don't have to have it on the pen. Uh, you can just use the, uh, the smoke control exhaust with a, a little hood on the end of the hose, and you'd use probably a 19 millimeter diameter hose for that. So, yeah, if you've got, say, people that are willing to work together, the nurse could be holding the, the hood on the end of the hose in close to the smoke source and uh, keep it under control that way. So, yeah, there's, say, the application of it is, is variable. It doesn't, some places it's working reasonably well and others not so much. Yes? Oh, Ed, it's so nice to hear that this is making progress. Um, I'm curious, I have two questions. One is, um, have you actually sold any of these units to hospitals in BC or elsewhere in Canada? Actually, three questions. Are you allowed to sell them in the US? And then um, is this electrocautery unit, uh, does it need to go through the whole CSA approval process? Right, OK, good questions. Thank you. The, the, uh, the central farm unit that CSA tested it has been sold to Kelowna General, and it's installed. And hopefully going to be put to use very soon in the regular delivery board there. Um, the, uh, there's, there's two kinds of fans. There's a central fan which can handle there's two, two arrangements of central fans. Basically, the single central fan that went to Kelowna can handle five or six or seven double masks at a time or up to seven uh, surgical smoke things at a time. And then there's a little portable unit that I've been demonstrating since 2009 which will have a one uh, mask or one electrocautery kind of thing. And those are both CSA approved. All, all three of those are basically CSA approved. And you can get the central fan and a double fan configuration, which is just two single fans on a common base plate connected up to the same control panel. So that's all CSA approved. But the, um, the valves and stuff aren't. And yeah, all we sold so far is that one system into Kelowna. So we haven't had any here to sell yet, but next week it's a different story. <laughs> so, and there is um, the small single fan is now available in the second, a new version that has the on-off valve for surgical smoke attached to it, or built into it. So, yeah, there's uh, that's something that actually when we shipped to CSA and tested, but when we got it back from CSA, it didn't work anymore. 
I, I think they did some kind of a destructive test on it at the end of their, <laughs> of their program. And when they plug it in, it just blows the fuse. So you get a little bit of smoke smell out of it, which is not really what you wanted. Um, so yeah, a replacement for that is in this shipment that should be released to us next week. Yes, um, our CSA approval applies to Canada and the U.S., but before we could sell in the U.S., we'd have to go through the FDA thing, like we did with Health Canada. And I'm a sucker for punishment, but I'm wanting to make a little money out of that in Canada before we go, <laughs> go through the U.S. thing. So, yeah, um, there's actually the first masks I saw went to Toronto, to uh, an esthetist who uh, works in dentist offices around Toronto. <coughs> and uh, I'm not sure how we found out about double masks, but he was worried about his exposure to the waste anesthetic gas that he was using to knock out the, the patients in the dentist offices. So he bought a couple of masks as soon as we got our license last fall, and he's tested them out, um, he's done measurements of nitrous oxide in these, these dental offices where he's working with and without the double mask and got very encouraging results. So he's had a paper describing that research accepted by an American journal, and it should be published sometime in the next two or three months probably. So that may stimulate demand from the states and give us a reason to try and get them licensed for sale in the states. That's, uh, yeah, that's kind of encouraging. They, apparently there are um, exhaust systems in a lot of dentist offices that will, you know, I think, yeah, from each connection point you get about, um, what, what, I'm talking CFM here, seven or eight CFM. So what he's done is connect two of those into the mask to get 15, 12 to 15 CFM, I think was what he said in his paper. Less, less more than what we normally would call for, but it's still working quite well for him. So, um, yeah, we, anyway, he's getting about two-thirds of the flow that we would normally specify. So maybe it's more like 14 or 15 CFM. And, yeah, that, that's working for him. So, yeah, he's, he's quite enthused, and hopefully that's going to stimulate the use of this in dental offices as well. Um, I guess uh, my question's on that same note, and you um, kind of addressed some of the points I was going to ask about. Um, mainly concerned with... Um, generating interest in this and actually, you know, marketing this product. Mm -hmm. um, considering that this, this kind of product has existed in Europe for, you know, a couple decades, do you still get to use your research, your results, all the things that you put work into to kind of, to sell this? Or do people just want to know all the things in Denmark? Well, I'm using a little of it here, right? Yeah. yeah. And yes, I've, I've um, talked to a number of people over the last eight, 10 years, I guess, almost now since I found out about Medicvent about how we got, you know, what we found out in our research. But yeah, I mean, the, the systems I developed, the prototypes I developed, became useless right after I read the paper about the medic vet one, right? So there's, yeah, no, no reason why I would go anywhere with that, uh, that sort of prototype. I figured that it would, to get from that prototype to something like the medic vet masks would cost at least a million dollars to build the, just to get the molds made, to make all the plastic moldings and stuff, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then to develop the fan and the control system and all the other components that go into it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, I went looking actually around the time, you know, just before I found out about MedicVent, I was looking for financial backers to do that development work and didn't get anywhere with that. So, yeah. That's, and like I said, once you find out there's a good product on the market, why would you bother spending a million or two developing an alternate product? Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to me. No? Okay, please join me in thanking Ed Chasso for a great presentation and for participating in our OEH seminar. Thank you. Thank you.